we focused on three of the four types of organic molecules found in the body, proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. There were a number of hormones in this chapter, and a little bit of physiology as well, especially that of diabetes and risk factors for heart disease. Keep in mind that my lecture is based off of overall mortality data as much as possible, and I try to avoid correlation. What you have learned about saturated fats and a few other things in other classes may be different from the way that I test you. Let's start with the difference between good fat and bad fat. Both of these are unsaturated fatty acids, meaning they have a carbon-carbon double bond somewhere in the hydrocarbon chain. This carbon-carbon double bond comes in two conformations. In the trans conformation, the hydrogen atoms are on opposite sides of the double bond. This means that the hydrocarbon chain is kept more rigid, which allows these molecules to pack more tightly, hence increasing their melting temperature, which makes them more likely to be solid at body temperature, causing plaques in our arteries, leading to heart disease and early death. On the other hand, in the cis conformation, this induces a kink in the molecule, meaning it cannot pack together as tightly, which means it's more likely to be liquid at body temperature. These good cis fats can actually remove other fats from artery walls and make them more liquid as well. Hence, it lowers the risk of heart disease. These are considered the healthy fats, and the more of these that we get in our diet, the better. However, we do not want to heat up these cis fats past their smoke point. Deep frying with healthy oils is not healthy because the heat that a stove can produce is capable of temporarily breaking the carbon-carbon double bond. When it reforms, which happens pretty quickly, it's more likely to reform in the trans conformation, which is the lower energy state. That's why cis fats are things that we need to eat from plant or animal sources. It takes enzymes to make these types of fat molecules. Both of these are in contrast to saturated fats, which have no carbon-carbon double bonds. It's important to note that while the trans fats were bad and the cis fats were good, saturated fats are neither of these. They are neither bad for our health nor good for our health. It is true that saturated fats can raise LDL levels, but that is a surrogate outcome. That does not in turn lead to early death due to heart disease. LDLs are, of course, considered bad cholesterol. To get fat to move around the body, it must be transported in a macromolecule like an LDL or an HDL. These contain fatty acid molecules and cholesterol in the core and a hydrophilic protein coating. LDLs are synthesized in the liver and transported to peripheral tissues for storage. Therefore, we tend to think of these as bad cholesterol because it's a sign that the body is storing more fatty acids. On the other hand, HDLs are made in peripheral tissue and sent back to the liver for excretion. We generally consider these good cholesterol because it's a sign that the body is removing excess fat. The HDLs, furthermore, can scavenge fat from off of artery walls on the way back to the liver, reducing the risk of heart disease, another reason why HDLs are considered good cholesterol. Nevertheless, both bad cholesterol and good cholesterol are macromolecules that the body makes, whereas good fats and bad fats are single molecules that we eat in our diet. Protein metabolism starts with the breakdown of peptide bonds between amino acid monomers. Next up, the two carbon atoms can be removed from the nitrogen atom. This nitrogen atom is not useful, and in fact the ammonia that we've now produced is toxic and needs to be neutralized. Covalently linking these ammonium ions to carbon dioxide can produce a molecule of urea which is much more stable and they're safer to dump into the bloodstream for eventual removal by the kidneys. 
these two carbon molecules can be attached to coenzyme A and then dumped into the Krebs cycle. Those R groups might need to be removed first. It, this is a process called ketosis, where we're breaking down proteins or fats for energy. Producing ketoacid intermediates, which are attached to coenzyme A. As long as there is plenty of coenzyme A, there is no problem with this ketosis. On the other hand, for people with diabetes or starving, there might not be enough coenzyme A, and the keto acids can build up in the bloodstream, leading to ketoacidosis, something we learned about in the fluid balance chapter. If ATP is not required, then the keto acids produced by protein breakdown can instead be used to synthesize fatty acids, which will ultimately be stored as a triglyceride in adipose tissue. This is lipolysis in reverse, or lipogenesis. One of the main risk factors for type 2 diabetes is a high glycemic diet. This can lead to chronically elevated blood glucose levels. In response to this, the beta islet cells of the pancreas will continually secrete insulin. Insulin can travel to target tissues, bind to insulin receptors, which will activate second messenger pathways, which will move glucose transporters to the plasma membrane, pumping glucose out of the blood into target tissues. The second messenger system will also activate enzymes which can metabolize that glucose, for instance converting it into a macromolecule such as glycogen or a triglyceride. With chronically elevated levels of insulin, this can lead to receptor down regulation meaning cells remove a number of the insulin receptors from the surface of their cells. This is type 2 diabetes. Because of the insufficient insulin signal, this patient will not be able to regulate blood glucose levels. An elevated blood glucose can damage small blood vessels in the eyes and extremities, leading to blindness and requiring amputation. It can alter neural function and lead to dehydration. It's important to get this under control as soon as possible, so one of the main treatments for type 2 diabetes is an insulin injection. This is problematic because elevated insulin was the problem in the first place, so adding even more insulin will only make the disease progressively worse. However, the short-term effects of elevated blood glucose are even more severe, and this warrants making sure that what few insulin receptors are left are working at peak efficiency to maintain blood glucose levels. Ideally, diet and exercise could help get blood glucose under control, which would lead to lower levels of insulin, which would lead to an upregulation of the insulin receptors. Alternatively, there are other medications which affect the liver, which we did not discuss.